Hey guys, this is the in service for high performance CPR. Um, we're going to discuss uh, how exactly how we perform high performance CPR and why. Uh, we're going to talk about the explicit details. In any resuscitation, there is a natural progression towards disorder. And there's actually a term for this. It's called uh, resuscitation room entropy. So it has a tendency to go from uh, order to chaos. And our goal is to prevent that from happening with good communication, which means we use closed loop communication, which you have, uh, you should remember from your uh, previous training on medic CE on uh, co uh, resuscitation communications. A lot of what we're going to discuss, uh, someone's already done. So it's not something that we are building from the ground up. Uh, however, we're using other people's processes for increasing out of hospital uh, survival from cardiac arrest. And we're extrapolating those uh, into our system. And I like this quote from Mickey Eisenberg. He says, success is a process, not an endpoint. Systems that are successful hardwire the fundamentals of the improvement process into their operational framework and organizational culture. The Resuscitation Academy has this mantra that everyone in VF survives. And it's something that I would also like us to think about adopting as well. And we probably should. We talk a lot about cardiac arrest survival being pointless or actually focusing on cardiac arrest survival being point, pointless. But this graphic shows you exactly what a 30% survival rate looks like. So if we had this many people in cardiac arrest each year, um, the ones in red demonstrate how many of those would survive. And to me, I think that it is a worthwhile endeavor. 30% survival is a pretty modest goal to start off with. The uh, folks in Seattle started off tracking this in about in early uh, 1970. And during that period, they had a survival rate of around 20%. Fast forward to 2016, they have a survival rate of nearly 60%. So they tripled their survival rate from witnessed VF arrest. We just began the tracking process and hopefully since they have already uh, told us how to do this, hopefully we can do it a little bit quicker by learning by learning from their mistakes and their trials. Something that I really want you to pay attention to on this graph is that you can see the uh, blue shaded areas. There's a pretty dramatic increase in survival during that time period. There's two, uh, two periods in which that occurred. The first one was when they implemented telephone CPR and actually we're working with our uh, uh, communication center to uh, improve this process as well. But around 2010, you see another increase and that was when they implemented high performance CPR which is what we're talking about today. So we're going to measure and improve, measure and improve. And that is our goal. Uh, we started off by tracking cardiac arrest survival using a Google form. Now we're tracking it through a credible registry called the CARES registry, which is the cardiac arrest registry to enhance survival. Uh, this is a national cardiac arrest registry. So all of our data is actually going into a national database and we can benchmark against uh, other EMS systems. And as of right now, when this video was made, we are one of two services. The only other service in the state of Kentucky submitting data to this registry is Louisville. So we should be pretty proud of that. So what is high performance CPR? Well, high performance CPR is what we want to achieve. So there are metrics for high performance CPR, and that is a CPR fraction, which is the percentage of time that the hands are in, on the chest greater than 80%, a CPR rate between 100 and 120, compression depth of two inches, adequate chest recoil, and a ventilation rate of less than 10 per minute. You can see that we're tracking a lot of these uh, during each event. So you should, most of you should have received a post-event review from CodeStat that list all of these metrics and what our goals are 
and actually how you performed on that call. This is what the code stat report looks like if you haven't seen it. Uh, it spits out your CPR ratio uh, and it does all of this after quite some intensive annotations within the program itself to make sure that we are getting accurate data and that we're sending accurate feedback to you. But it gives you your CPR fraction or ratio, the compression rate, and your ventilation rate. Now note that the ventilation rate may be lower than it actually is depicted on the top of the CPR report. And this is because uh, sometimes it doesn't calculate that rate until the uh, entitled CO2 waveform is viewed. Um, so you may actually need to just look at the CPR rate per minute as opposed to using the rate up here. Now there is a correlation between high performance CPR and survival. So this is a very commonly used graph showing that without CPR, each minute that goes by is correlated with a 10% decrease in survival. However, uh, cardiac arrest is reversible. So with high quality CPR, we can decrease that from 10% each minute to 2% each minute. So if we arrive on scene, initiate high performance or high quality CPR, we can have a very dramatic, we can affect a very dramatic change or improve the patient's chance of surviving just with good quality CPR. If you look at this, um, a common question people ask is, well, should we provide CPR first or should, should we defibrillate first? The theory is that since CPR is reversible or since cardiac arrest is reversible, if we arrive on scene and we have a patient in fine VF, if we provide a period of high quality CPR, we can flood the heart with essential oxygen and nutrients and reverse that or revert that fine VF back into coarse VF, which would generally result in a, a shock that converts it to either a, uh, a PEA rhythm or a perfusing rhythm as opposed to just a systole. So since this is the case, a lot of people wonder, should we provide a period of CPR before we defibrillate? And the truth is that if, as soon as you arrive on scene, you begin high-performance CPR, uh, while uh, the other person applies the pads and charges the capacitor, then that takes about two minutes. So you essentially are providing a period of CPR before you defibrillate. So something that a lot of people may not be familiar with is that it takes approximately 30 quality compressions before you maximize perfusion, uh, before you, quote, prime the pump. And as soon as you stop CPR, the perfusion to the heart and the brain goes back to zero, as it does right here, and then it takes about 30 more compressions um, before, you, uh, before you reach a steady state of perfusion. So imagine if you are performing high quality CPR, you reach a steady state of perfusion, and then you stop, and then it takes you about 10 seconds to defibrillate. Do you think that that uh, shock would be as successful as if you defibrillated as soon as you stop CPR? The answer is no, it would not. So this just demonstrates how important it is, how important high quality CPR is to improving the patient's chance of survival and how deleterious any pause can be. So again, we're going to talk about each detail of high performance CPR and what that means and how we achieve it. Rate of 100 or 120. Uh, you can see on this uh, chart that a rate between 100 and 120 is associated with the highest probability of achieving ROSC, and it's actually closer to 120. So if you compress any faster than 120, then uh, the probability of ROSC decreases, and if you compress any less than a rate of 120, then the probability of ROSC decreases. So we're going to aim for a sweet spot of around 110. Now, how do you compress at a rate of 110? Well, you use a metronome. Now, there are a lot of different metronome apps, but I found the best way 
uh, to set up a metronome on my phone is to do a to search uh, Google for metronome, set it at 110, play it, and I can actually turn my phone off and the metronome will keep playing. When, when reviewing code stat reports, we generally see uh, people compressing way too fast, 130 or 140 a minute, and this is often um, from uh, other first responders, but we can actually help, uh, help them control this rate by setting up a metronome and having it going before we even arrive on the call so that as soon as we walk in, the metronome is going. Now once we arrive on scene, we're going to start off with continuous CPR. We're not going to do 30 to 2 until we have more hands on the call uh, to provide the breaths. So we'll start off with one person doing compressions and the other person applying the pads, analyzing the rhythm and defibrillating. But a lot of people may ask, well, why don't we just do continuous CPR and provide asynchronous breaths since we uh, since that should decrease the amount of time that it takes to ventilate and pause CPR for that ventilation? The answer is that it really doesn't matter what you do. Um, and they found this in, a, uh, in an actual trial that Performing continuous CPR compared to pausing for breaths did not result in improved survival. And when we actually look at the data a little bit more, we find that in both groups, the intervention group, which was continuous CPR, and the control group, which was interruptions, they both had a very similar CPR fraction. In the continuous CPR group, their CPR fraction was about 83%. In the uh, group that interrupted CPR for breaths, it was about 77%. So there was just a very minuscule difference between the two of them. Now, it should be noted that this study was performed by an EMS system that had implemented pit crew and high-performance CPR. So they were very skilled at resuscitation. So their breaths were probably kept very short and they were right back on the chest. Now we want a CPR fraction greater than 80%. Ideally, we want it to get up to 90, and then it sort of plateaus. So the national standard is uh, a percentage of time on the hand, a percentage of time uh, performing CPR greater than 80%. Our internal goal is 90%. I believe we can get there, and we have quite a few teams that have done that. We want a depth of 2 to 2.4 inches. There's no really good way to measure this without a feedback device, and even those have, uh, have some problems. The best way to do it is probably using a CPR feedback mannequin and actually get the feel for what 2 to 2.4 inches is. We also want adequate recoil. What that means is that you actually bring the palm of your hand off of the chest. Historically, we've been taught that we don't want to lift the palm of our hand, uh, the palm of our hand off of the chest. Uh, this is no longer the case. So when you're interlocking your fingers and you're compressing on the center of the chest, you can keep your fingers on the patient's chest and just slightly lift your palm up to ensure that you're allowing recoil. We have a tendency to lean on the chest, especially if we start getting fatigued. And we want everyone on the team, everyone that's uh, in the resuscitation to actually monitor CPR quality and ensure that is not happening and provide feedback to the per person performing CPR. Our next high performance CPR metric is to avoid hyperventilation. This is generally a, a major issue. People generally squeeze the bag too hard and too fast, but I have to say from reviewing uh, code stat reports that this isn't really the case here. Everyone is generally ventilating the patient between 8 to 10 times a minute, uh, sometimes a little faster, sometimes a little slower. Um, this can be very difficult to, to, to do, and what I recommend is that uh, if you're not performing 30 to 2, if the patient has an advanced airway and you're pr providing asynchronous ventilation, what you want to do is squeeze the bag about once every 10th to 12th compression and that will help you prevent hyperventilating the patient. Uh, hyperventilation is deadly. You can do everything right. Uh, you can perform the best CPR, defibrillate, give pressors, do all of the things you're supposed to do, 
but if you hyperventilate the patient, they will not survive. Uh, this was proven in a study where they noted that paramedics average a ventilation rate of 30 plus or minus around three a minute. They even tried to do repeat training with these paramedics. They sent them back out on the street and they still averaged that. Uh, the range was anywhere from 15 to 49. So the average duration of the breath was uh, one plus or minus uh, 0 0.07 seconds. And if you imagine each breath takes at least one second, that's a whole lot of pauses. Um, and that's a whole lot of time that the bag is actually being squeezed and the, and the intrathoracic pressure is being increased, thereby decreasing venous return. Um, no patient that they tracked survived when they ventilated the patient uh, at a rate of around 30 per minute. There was also another study in pigs where they compared the ventilation rate and they looked at how many pigs survived. When the ventilation rate was 12, 6 out of 7 pigs survived. When it was 20, 1 out of 7 survived. And when it was 30, 1 out of 7 survived. So survival is directly tied to how fast you squeeze the bag. One of our other goals is to keep our pre-shock pause less than 10 seconds. What does this mean? That means that as soon as you stop compressing the chest, once you bring your hands off of the chest, we want to defibrillate the patient as soon as possible. We want, to, we want the shock to be delivered in a nutrient and oxygenated uh, and ATP rich environment. This is how we increase the chance of successfully defibrillating the patient. How do we do this? Well, we really do this with good communication. So the person on the monitor is actually going to have to coordinate with the prefer person performing CPR uh, to coordinate this shock. Uh, and something that we're going to start doing, and you can actually, some people are already doing this, is as soon as you're ready to defibrillate, you have them continue CPR while you charge the monitor. So at about a minute, 45 seconds in, you charge the monitor, you tap them on the hands, you say pause CPR, they hover their hands over the patient's chest, you defibrillate, tap their hands again, and have them start CPR immediately. So when should we put the Lucas on? I've had a whole lot of questions, discussions, and uh, debates about this topic. And what it boils down to is that there is no um, there's there's no evidence that mechanical CPR is better than um, manual CPR. In fact, there's evidence that pit crew CPR results in higher survival rates than even scripted mechanical CPR implementation. There are a lot of different reasons for this. Uh, one reason, some think that one reason is that mechanical CPR is too consistent. So this was a clinical pilot study of different hand positions during manual chest compressions. And they monitored uh, in tidal CO2 and how that correlated with the different hand positions. What they found was that when you compress the internipple line where we're toe to, uh, 10 patients had the highest in tidal CO2 However, um, when you compress two centimeters below that, uh, seven patients had the highest in tidal CO2. So compressing the left ventricle, uh, there, there may be actually be anatomical differences from patient to patient. Sometimes when you compress the inner nipple line right in the center of the chest, you may, be, may actually be compressing the aorta and not compressing over the left ventricle. Now, I'm not arguing or telling you that you should change how you perform CPR or where you perform CPR. Rather, I'm just simply stating that mechanical CPR, if it's in the wrong place, um, right in the inner nipple line, it's going to compress that 100% of the time, almost all of the time, unless it shifts, which it occasionally does. Uh, but when you're performing manual CPR, you're not as likely to be as consistent. So you're generally going to move your hands around a little bit in different places. Additionally, what we found is that we tend to interrupt compressions longer than we think we do when we're trying to place mechanical CPR. And we generally do this 
early uh, in the arrest during the sweet spot, during the sweet period where if we perform high quality CPR and defibrillate the patient, we're most likely to uh, obtain ROSC. Now, why would we interrupt CPR during that period that is most essential for obtaining return of spontaneous circulation? It doesn't make much sense to me. So high-performance CPR is what we want to achieve. We know what high-performance CPR is, but how do we do that? Logistically, it's very difficult, uh, but it can be done, and we're going to do it. And it may take a while. It may take a long time before we're actually uh, operating um, at that level. So we're implementing a protocol. Where we have these protocols submitted. Uh, you may be watching this when we've already implemented the protocol but there's no reason that we actually have to ha have a protocol uh, to perform uh, PICRU CPR. This is a logistics and operational initiative rather than a protocol initiative but I think that having a protocol will solidify it a little bit more. So this is uh, basically how you're going to assign roles once people arrive on scene and it tells you who should be filling what position. So if you're the first arriving ambulance you're going to fill pit crew positions one and two which focus on high quality CPR and cardiac monitor analysis and defibrillation. Uh, the first arriving unit does not begin ventilation unless someone else is already on scene performing CPR and placing an AED. And this is kind of what it looks like. So position one is continuous CPR until uh, the second unit or other uh, responders arrive to ventilate. So position one is CPR. Position two is uh, on the AED or the monitor. Um, position one and two could be a BLS unit, could be the fire department. Uh, it could be an ALS unit that's waiting on another ambulance. And then once another unit arrives, they fill position 3 and 4, which is ventilations and um, uh, IO or IV and medications. Uh, if position 1 and 2 is a BLS unit or the fire department, then position 4 will also uh, connect the monitor to, their, um, to, to the AED's pads and uh, once, once they're getting close to the end of the two minute cycle, they're going to pre-charge the monitor at a minute 45, and then they will coordinate the rotations between one and three, um, or one and two, depending on the configuration. Uh, we'll have a checklist that uh, if we have enough personnel on scene, uh, the person in the bottom left, uh, most likely the supervisor, is going to monitor the process or the person on the bottom right, rather, they're going to uh, complete the checklist. They're going to talk with the family. So um, the most difficult part of coordinating pit crew CPR is what to do when you get to a minute 45. You're 15 seconds away from uh, switching uh, compressors, analyzing the rhythm, and defibrillating the patient. Uh, this can be technically difficult. So once these positions are filled, once all four of these positions are filled, if person number two, what we're teaching the fire departments to do is they generally have three man crews. Once they arrive on scene and fill all three of these positions, person number two is going to coordinate the rotation between three and one. So at a minute 45, uh, person number three is going to drop the BVM rotate next to person number one. When the AD is charging, person number one is going to continue CPR while it's charging and as soon as it is charged, uh, person number two is going to tell them to pause CPR, they're going to defibrillate, and then person number three who is right here next to person number one is going to immediately resume CPR. And that's how we're going to do the transition uh, with the fire department or with EMS if we're first to arrive on scene and have a two or three man configuration. If a BLS unit or the fire department is already on scene, we still want them to continue that rotation, um, but we can do it a little bit differently. Once person number four has switched over the pads 
and has um, has placed the monitor in manual mode rather than AED mode at a minute 45 they're going to pre-charge the monitor and then person number one and person number two can then rotate between CPR so that they don't have to keep switching like this it's just less movement for person number one and person number two to rotate through CPR since the team leader or uh, position number four will then be coordinating uh, the switch and the defibrillation. Uh, I hope that all of this makes sense. Hopefully the video will help you to uh, help solidify this a little bit more. And then we're going to be performing competencies on uh, pit crew CPR. And um, we're going to implement this as a standard at Jessamine County EMS. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you.